Are you at war with distraction? Louis Angel was until he found memory techniques. He went from nearly failing in life to racing forward with his educational goals and ultimately winning a very big award on national television. And the title of Superhuman is... Memory Master Lewis Angel! Not only was this accomplishment epic in its own right, but all the more so since Lewis was competing against his own teacher, Ron White. So to dig deeper into how it's possible for someone to go from poor focus and shattered concentration to becoming an absolute memory master who outpaces his own teacher, I reached out to Lewis and we recorded this detailed conversation for you. You can find Lewis on his own YouTube channel where I highly recommend you get subscribed. And if you like conversations like this one, please subscribe here as well. And for the love of memory, hit that thumbs up because it helps us all remind the robots that humans still care about those big, beautiful brains of ours. Now, let's dive in for an epic conversation filled with tips you can use with Lewis Angel. Lewis, thanks so much for joining me on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. I've wanted to speak with you for years, so it's good to finally make this happen. Uh, what is your journey into this whole crazy world of memory? How, how did it all start for you? Yeah, well, first, thank you so much uh, for having me on your Magnetic Memory show. It's been a uh, uh, I've been, you know, following you as well for for several years. You put out amazing content, help out a lot of individuals to help them improve their memory, improve their focus, and just tap into their power, mind's power. So I appreciate everything that you have done and still continue to do for the community. Um, mm -hmm. So grateful, grateful to be here. But yeah, my journey is. I mean, it's one of those, um, you know, I, I was struggling. So <laughs> I like to say it was a struggle to success type of story where I was literally, I, I remember the, the moment where I said enough is enough. And we've all hit those like rock bottom, rock bottom moments. For me, it was like this mental rock bottom where I was doing very, very poorly in school. I got kicked out of college for a session for a quarter because I just kept failing I kept withdrawing from, from classes for various reasons, personal reasons, family reasons. And also I just, I could not concentrate. I could not retain the information that I was learning and I had all the same struggles throughout high school, middle school, high school, um, how to repeat like my freshman, my ninth grade English class, my freshman English class. I was still taking that as a senior in high school. Wow. <laughs> That's how badly I was doing in school. So um, just, yeah, that was mounting on top of like just work related focus and memory issues, disciplinary issues that I was getting from my superiors. Um, and I was sitting out, we have an island called Catalina Island off of the coast of California. And I was sitting out after forgetting all of my, all the major tools that I needed to complete all the jobs because we have to like load everything into this huge bucket and then they ship us out on a boat on a ferry to to the island and that's it if we didn't bring what we needed to bring all the tools and we couldn't like go back to a warehouse we were just we're stuck until the ferry picked us up so i remember looking out into the water cuz i had just like missed all my jobs because i i forgot all my tools and i'm like is this it like i'm i'm doing miserable in every aspect of my life i'm about to get fired the moment i get back on land i'm going to get fired <laughs> so um that's when I like that moment just shifted in my mind to where I was like, I need to fix this. I saw psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, memory experts, you name it. I, I, it, it was a, a very um, like eye opening experience for me to be at that point. But knowing that I did not want to stay there and uh, just starting to seek different help and, and different opportunity to get me out of that hump. So that's kind of how this journey started is um, I was in a terrible place mentally. Right, right. That's interesting. I mean, that seems to be a pretty common story that people don't take action. They don't transform themselves unless they're in a miserable place. Do, does that seem to you a common denominator or is there case studies? I know you've taken a team, for example, to compete. Are there case studies where people have other entries into memory training where they're not you know, totally <laughs> under the thumb of suffering? Yeah, I mean, I, I we both know Nelson Dallas. <laughs> right, right. He's a, an ama amazing memory athlete, four-time USA memory champ. Uh, has multiple records in the U.S. and he has won, you know, 
d- different awards all over the world for these competitions. But I mean, he he didn't quote unquote, unquote suffer from uh, memory issues uh, directly from like failing school or things similar to what I had. His story was more like, you know, he saw his grandma having dementia and Alzheimer's and passing away from that. So that's what motivated him. Some type of, of uh, I guess, yeah, some type of negative experience, whether personally or you know somebody with with memory issues, focus issues, things like that, that that really triggers you to get into the sport. Other people, like some of my students, that, like you're saying, I took to the USA Memory Championship. They were like extremely bright. They were so smart. They were taking calculus, second year calculus, physics, like all these college level courses in high school, AP courses and passing them A pluses. And they were just like these savants that wanted to do better. I'm like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> Why are you guys here? You guys are already super smart. Like, wow, we just want to do even better. Um, and, you know, I ended up taking them to the USA competition. But yeah, I guess people get involved into the sport for different aspects either. And, and I think the common denominator of all that is they just want to get better, whether you're in a very terrible place, mentally, spiritually, whatever it is, and you want to improve that even a little bit, um, or you're already very wow at doing what you're currently doing and you just want to still be able to memorize a deck of cards in a few minutes or remember the person that you met, you know, at, at the meeting. Um, I think everybody just, no matter where you're at on that spectrum, you, you always want to do better. Right. Right. Well, let's go back to the, to the boat and you got all these negative thoughts. How did we get from there to like raw mnemonics, actually creating associations, maybe using a memory palace and, um, you know, saving yourself using, uh, memory training and or exactly how that works. Yeah, so I was going to see doctors. This is, this was the first time that I went to uh, see like any type of help for whether it's physical or mental ha- help to to fix something that I had because I'm someone that even as a kid, my mom was trying to chase me down to give me my medicine because I did not want to take it no matter what flavor, grape flavor, fruit flavor, whatever <laughs> it was, I refused to take the medicine. I, I never liked taking anything as a kid headache. I didn't care. I was going to tough it out. You know, I, I broke all, every, all kinds of bones. I broke my hand. I broke my, my pink. I broke both of my pinkies um, <laughs> and playing football. And I never took like pain medication, none of that. So I was um, when I started seeking help to help me out with this, uh, with these issues, like these mental issues, I they, they prescribe me the pills, um, the, the Ritalins, the Adderalls, Concertas, all the other different uh, medication for ADHD and attention deficit disorder, which is, they told me that I had that and a few other things like social anxiety and um, other issues. And I'm like, okay, I guess this is my only fix. This is my only solution is to take these pills. And honestly, it did help me. It helped me from to take me from where I was to where I thought I wanted to be. Um, because when I first started taking that medication, I was like, yes, I'm super focused, super alert. But then after a few hours, boom, it waned Mm. away. You know, the the effects were gone. Um, And then what what did the doctor say at that point? Just take more, take a higher dose, Uh, take more, or let's switch up your medication. Maybe Ritalin is not working. Let's give you some Adderall or Adderall is not working. Let's give you this other one. So they switching it up. Um, And for me, I I just found that as a bandaid, like a temporary bandaid to a, a problem that I had. And it helped me, but then boom, I would crash. Help me and crash. Like where, how can I get a permanent fix for this? Um, and that's when I started seeking like the personal on the personal development realm. I found Ron White, who uh, I'm sure you know of. He's been in the game for 20 plus years, I think yeah. like 25 years. And I got his course and I was so hungry to go and, and just improve myself that it was like a whole month. He has, he had this memory in a month program at that time. Um, and so it's a whole month to do that. It's like each day he gives you different tasks to do, like memorize this list, memorize, you know, some numbers, memorize words, different things that he has to do, create these visual um, mnemonics. Uh, and at that point I had no idea what a mnemonic was. <laughs> so to right. be visually um, to, to learn information using these visual techniques was very new to me. I was like, why didn't I learn this in school? I would not have been failing all my classes. Like I was. Um, and so like I, I did the whole program in less than a week, I think like in three or four days, once I actually like sat down and did it, um, like in three or four days, I was done with the whole program. And then I started doing it again. And that was just like a miracle had just happened from where I was to at that point was like, 
I was the greatest memorizer in the entire world in my mind. <laughs> you know, that was prior to meeting actually Ron White, Nelson, Brad's up, and all these amazing individuals in the memory sport uh, world. But uh, at that point, I was like, dude, I'm I'm a genius. <laughs> Thank you, Ron White, for turning right. me into a genius. But uh, um, yeah, that was kind of my uh, my start into the actual realm of, of mnemonics was going through Ron White's program. Right. Yeah, Ron's great. He was on the show not too long ago. Um, yeah. What does it feel like uh, to have a- 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 the um, ADHD? You know, what, what what is that actual experience like? I mean, it's d- definitely now it's m- much different. Like I, <laughs> I've said that I've uh, I don't have it anymore. But uh, honestly, like it it does still come about. I don't think you can ever get rid of having these um these like focus issues and memory problems when it comes to having attention deficit disorder. And I think everybody really has. Uh, even an ounce of it in some ways. Some people have it more than others. And it's just a matter of when you're trying to focus on the one task that you need to do, such as doing your homework, Mm -hmm. then you get a million other things going on in your mind. Oh, what about that TV show? I want to see what's going on on the real world or the Kim Kardashian show, or, you know, am I going to, what did I eat earlier today? Or I'm still hungry. I got to go. So all these other thoughts start running around in your mind the pretty girl I forgot to talk to. And, you know, so you, you get all these thoughts that you, I don't want to say choose to, but your, your brain just kind of tells you that this assignment right now is not as important as all these other thoughts running through your mind. Nowadays, it's like social media. Social media is the biggest trigger for AD, ADD, ADHD, and you're always just scrolling through and getting that quick dopamine hit. Um, so I think just like living with this, it, it, it's an issue when you don't know how to control it, when you don't know how to snap out of it. Because you can get into these loops, mm. these uh, these distraction zones, as I like to call them, where you are are happy and you're content because you're smiling. You have that smile on your face as you're scrolling through Instagram, through TikTok, because they're they're entertaining you. You're watching videos, and it might seem like a few seconds have gone by, but in reality, it, it ends up adding up into hours. So um, that can be a huge problem if you want to mm. be productive. So I think the biggest issue with having um, ADD that you don't know how to control is that it does take away from from being productive in society, in your own life, f- to accomplishing the tasks that you want to. Um, and it also affects other parts of, of you know your mentality, such as for me, it was memory. The I think the number one reason why people suffer from memory issues where they meet somebody and they quote unquote, forget their name two seconds after they meet them and you interchange names. You know, my name is Lewis. You tell me your name is Anthony. And then we're talking. I'm like, bro, what is his name? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the reason for that is because I was not really focused on gaining or on, on grabbing your name and, and holding it onto memory. I was already thinking about the next thing that we, you and I were going to say, oh, Anthony, awesome. Hey man, I like your long hair. I wish I had hair. You know, my mind's already <laughs> gone. My mind's already two to three steps ahead of grabbing this name and really storing it into memory and many other things. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, it can affect having ADHD, ADD definitely can, I think, in my opinion, it, it does correlate with having uh, what you think is having a memory uh, memory issues. And but there is a way what I found to to really help alleviate um, many of those issues. Okay. Um, well, I I think that memory training itself is a great way. And I yeah. don't know what you think, but uh, I've looked at some research, and so that dopamine that people are missing. Uh, it, I think it's produced by the, just the use of n- mnemonics and probably in multiple mm. ways because you're getting some co- sort of entertainment as you're making these associations. And then you yes. get the, ah, I actually remembered it, which is, you know, this this spike yes. in um, in dopamine. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what happened when I was going through Ron's program is I started getting a rush of dopamine. Right, right. <laughs> I didn't know at that time, but I wasn't getting that before. I wasn't I I wasn't doing my essays, my assignments in school because I I in my mind that one I equated that to taking too long to do whereas watching a TV show it's only 30 minutes, it's fine. It's only a 30 minute block, but in my mind doing a homework assignment, no, that's a 3-4 hour block. I'm not going to sit down for 3 to 4 hours to do my research, to write this and you know, I don't even know how to get started. I can barely put my name on this paper, let alone like start typing. And so I was like, "No, I'll put that off and then go and watch TV or go watch something else um or do something else, go play outside with my friends." And and yeah, I wasn't getting the dopamine from the homework. I was getting it from other sources. But like you're saying, memory training, when, when I started going through his course, 
I'm like, this is amazing. Yes, I'm creating all these visual stories in my mind. I'm, you know, associating a dinosaur biting this, uh, <laughs> they're very graphic and, and violent at times, <laughs> but biting off this child's head, <laughs> you know, and then, oh, this is pretty cool and unique. Um, and that means that, you know, that number is like 9542. That's crazy. I could have never have guessed that that's how you would have gotten from this dinosaur biting a kid's head to 9542. Um, so creating these visual stories definitely uh, increases. I believe, like you're saying, um, these dopamine rushes that get you kind of addicted to memorizing using these methods. Right, right. Well, so it's not just a memory issue. It's also just a focus issue and you know, being prepared to focus, it seems. So what kind of tips do you have for the people walking into the room? They meet new people or some new detail is going to come out so that even without memory techniques, you might mem- remember more just simply because you're able to focus your mind. Uh, it, it almost yeah. seems like it's two different techniques, um, focus and then application of memory techniques. So if we just deal with one at a time, you know, what do you, what do you do to focus yourself? Yeah, I think it, it definitely comes from doing the work ahead of time um, in order to train yourself so that when you're in that moment, you can quickly snap out of it. Like those, what I was saying, distraction zones, but um. You, it's about doing simple tasks. For me, it's I, I'm very huge on meditation. Mm. So I make sure to take the time to really just turn everything off, put my my phone on airplane mode, you know, close my laptop, turn off all distractions, and then just sit there with my meditation music and just close my eyes, taking a deep breath and relax for those several minutes that I have to relax. And focus in on just my breathing, focus in on just the blue light that I see in my mind's eye, you know, and different, uh, different visualizations that I go through as well while I'm doing that. That I believe more than anything else can help out anyone to increase your ability to focus is having some type of uh, meditation regimen. Mm-hmm. And, and it doesn't have to be a 15 to 30 minute session. It doesn't have to be an hour session. One of the things that I learned about social media is you have these short attention spans, but not really, because again, you're, you're, you can stay there for hours on end, but feel that if it's only been a few seconds, why? Cause they're very smart at giving you just little bits of chunks, chunks of data at a time, right? Mm-hmm. Chunks of, uh, of videos at a time, just those 15 seconds, 15 seconds, and then another 15 seconds and another 15 seconds. So I like to kind of do that with, with the, anything that I do, um, especially if I have a tough time starting, but with meditation specifically, it was pretty tough in the beginning to just sit there alone with just my thoughts and try to clear off any other thoughts that I had besides just thinking about breathing in or thinking about the blue light that I'm seeing or thinking about whatever it is that I'm meditating on in that moment. Um, and so you, I started with just one minute, one minute of meditation. I set my timer, one minute, boom, close my eyes, relax, 60 seconds go by, open my eyes. And that was it. That was it for the day. I didn't mm-hmm. do any more than one minute. And then the next day you do two minutes and then the next day you do three minutes and maybe you want to stay at three minutes for a few more days because you start noticing that you're getting distracted much more easily. But then you keep, you know, improving that and increasing that until you're at a a steady pace where you can literally sit there uninterrupted and not have that urge and that, that, yeah, that, that sense of going up and doing something else because you think something else is more important than what you're doing right there and then, but just sitting there for 15 minutes straight for 30 minutes straight. Why? Because now taking that activity and applying to a memory competition where you literally have to sit in a competition, if it's a world memory championship for an hour straight and memorize as many decks of cards as you possibly can. You cannot get to that point if you haven't mastered the ability to just sit down by yourself and not think about other thoughts, but the one that you have right there in front of you for at least 15 minutes. Because you now have to go and compete for an hour straight in that one event or an hour straight of memorizing numbers. And you, if you start letting other, other thoughts go in your mind while you're memorizing a, you know, a a thousand digit number, you're only going to get a few digits of that when it comes to recall, because your mind's in la la land thinking about a million other things. Um, So that, that would be my, one of my biggest tips is start some type of meditation um, regimen and and do it i would recommend to do it like in baby steps especially if you've never done it or it's been a while or you've tried it but you're like no it takes too long do it in baby steps do it a few minutes a day and then increase it gradually to where you get to a very comfortable uh spot where you can do that because now you go into the real world and you can easily snap out of it you've already anchored that feeling of being present being in the zone 
by doing something as simple as meditating. And then that starts compounding into every other area of your life, um, whether you're meeting somebody or you're you know, doing a presentation and you, you need to focus on that, that presentation without getting distracted. That's where in your mind, you're immediately going to think, all right, boom, let's switch that, that focus. So while you're meditating, you can probably say a few little anchor words like focus, 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 or whatever you want to attach to that. That way, when you're in different situations, you say that one word and that feeling of being focused comes right back into your body. So that's what I would, uh, you know, the biggest thing I would recommend for somebody that's struggling with focusing is uh, to do, you know, some form of meditation and then do it in, in gradual increments. Yeah, yeah that's great. That's brilliant. Uh, about meditation, in your mind, is there a difference between the blue light you see and the image you have for King of Clubs or however you do card memorization? Um, I mean, it's uh, I go into the same same space when I am meditating than when I am memorizing. So in my mind, it's the same arena. And I just when I'm meditating, I empty out that arena and I only see one thing. So in in front of me, it would be the blue light. If if I have like the blue light meditation, or if I see a waterfall, I'll just sit there and then I'll just see that waterfall. Because what happens is when I stop seeing that one thing, I know I'm already thinking about something else. And that's where these distractions start coming up. And then you're paying attention to, you know, the current events that are happening, the Afghanistan war and, you know, and some other pol- politics, some um, things that you forgot to do, some documents that you, you forgot to sign, you know, all these other things start popping up when you stop seeing the, the blue light or when you stop seeing your, your focal point for like a waterfall, a horse, a dog, whatever it is that you choose. For me, it's that blue light and other things that I like to just look at when I get bored of a blue light. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, focusing on the one thing. Um, I know I remember uh, hearing about someone that said like uh, uh, open eye meditation would be to just like stare at a doorknob for 10 minutes straight. Just stare at the doorknob. Don't stare at anything else. Peripheral would just go away. Everything else would be blurry, but just stare at that doorknob for 10 minutes. And if you start noticing other thoughts come into your mind and you or literally when, when you start seeing that the doorknob is like disappearing, you know, you're starting to focus on other things. So that's kind of where I, I modify that into the way that I do it. But, um, but yeah, I guess it's a uh, very similar because now I, I kinda, I'm already in that arena and that's my anchor point so that when I go to memorize the King of clubs, um, you know, which is just uh, a club, <laughs> a club right. for me, um, then I, I can easily just see that that it's like green glowing um, uh, club for the King of clubs, the green glowing club in my mind. And that's how I'm, um, I'm visualizing that in like that same place where, where I meditate. And it's easier for me because I'm already, my body, my brain, my mind is already in that zone of fully focusing on the one thing. Right. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I asked because it seems to me that if we were to have all the machines and all the budget to run the, uh, the scientific studies, we would find that encoding cards or numbers or vocabulary or whatever is almost identical to any sort of image based meditation or deity based meditation because you know you're focusing on maybe you're not uh using in- elaborative encoding to work with a waterfall but it would be so so similar in terms of that focus and intensity on a mental image uh, right that uh, you would get pro- quite likely the ben- benefit of meditative effects just from hard memorization of say a deck of cards yeah, I can see how, yes, I definitely agree with you because you, if you want to use the methods, the mnemonic methods that uh, we apply as memory athletes uh, to memorize something, then if you don't, well, uh, there are some individuals, so I don't want to uh, just speak in an absolute here, but, um, and I'll give an example on the counter, but uh, yes, if we're not seeing that image in our mind or we don't get a sense, like the feeling of that image in our bodies, then we will probably have a less likely chance of being able to recall that come recall time, if we're speaking in a competition setting. Um, but there are individuals, the reason why I bring up the, the sense and the feeling is like, uh, there's an individual, her name is Yenja. Um, I'm sure you know of her. Mm-hmm. And she's from Sweden. She's from like Mongolia, Sweden. She, <laughs> she knows like a thousand different languages. She's amazing. She's incredible. But um, I believe for names is where she says she doesn't really um, visualize like how I would or like a, or like how I learned from Ron White 
where we have to turn every name into an image and associate that to the face somehow. She just gets like a feeling of, oh, that's John. Oh, that's Anthony. Oh, that's Lisa. She just gets this like synesthetic feeling of what that name is with that person and has some type of like bonding experience. Um, Katie uh, Kermode, I believe is her last name, Katie from, from England, is very similar as well, where she gets like some type of feeling for for that new, and it's not like a visual um mnemonic is more like i just i know that that's that person's name and they have they break records those two go back and forth with breaking or for like a period of a few years they're going back and forth okay like katie's now number one and names and faces okay now it's yanja okay katie overtook her and then yanja so they're like going back and forth for for a few years for that number one title and when i talk to them about how do you do it how are you breaking these records ah, i just get a, like a, a sense of of what what their name is so um so yeah, uh, but like that, that's their way of, I, I guess, like in the way that I'm describing like meditation where, um, yeah, that it's probably very similar in that, in that sense. But uh, either way, whether you're memorizing using the old fashioned visualizing or, uh, or feeling your way through it, I think uh, you're right. I think you're right with, um, with the testing between meditation and that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where that would go, but um, so about visualizing, I mean, there's some people who don't see images at all. I don't tend to see images. I you don't know. even, I don't even know what that means. I mean, what does it mean to see an image? Don't you see pictures on a wall? You know, when I close my eyes, I imagine a picture on a wall. I don't see anything because seeing is what my eyes do. Right. So um, I've always thought, you know, you've probably heard of aphantasia and the, the idea of no mind's eye. I've always thought that that's some sort of linguistic puzzle because of course, nobody mm. has a mind's eye. Your eyes yeah. are on your head. They see things, they bring things into the brain. You close your eyes, you can call it seeing if you want, but that's not that's 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 not really the thing, right? But right, right. But I literally can't say like I don't see things in the way that people describe. Some people say, "No, I'm visual. I close my eyes, I see, you know, a club. If it's if your image for a King of Clubs is a club, I mean, are you seeing it? You have a I visual, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or what? What? Like, I really want to pin people down who say they see things in their minds. Like, what literally is happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, but you do imagine mm. whatever your image is for that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I guess it's more like just linguistics. Um, yes, I'm not technically seeing it with my actual eyes. But at the same time, when you're seeing something, are you really seeing it, even if you have your eyes open? Exactly. <laughs> because at the end of the day, it's just your brain interpreting those electrical signals going from here all the way to the back of your brain and that's getting interpreted in its own weird way you see a certain color let's say red i might see that same red but my brain's interpreting in a different fashion so what is really seen if we want to get that i even, guess it's just to like simplify um the way that we want to explain this and teach this to others uh right. yeah it's uh your seat <laughs> so that's what, whatever i do yeah close your eyes you're still seeing a, uh, a club or you're still seeing a lion um but yeah you can say you're imagining uh, a lion or you imagine that you're see imagine that you're seeing um i think that would be a better way of phrasing it right uh, yeah. well not to get too into the semantics but <laughs> you you gave a perfect example of exactly how simple and complicated it is at the same time when you were talking about staring at a doorknob and when the doorknob disappears you know that your mind is wandering and mm -hmm. we've all had that experience or at least i have of you mm -hmm. know and, and it's exactly what happens when you miss someone's name you you're you're so off in some other territory you're not seeing so to speak or even hearing the thing that's right in front of you right yeah so, exactly um yeah the whole notion of visualization is, is is super interesting so you know maybe we can talk a little bit about what you do when you encode and mm -hmm. um you know how you how you more about the focus topic because it seems to me there's got to be like a refocusing when you when you do recall um yeah so you know what is a uh, that, that's a very literal sort of thing to do with a club for a king of clubs but what is king of hearts okay it's a crown <laughs> okay the kings were uh, so when i was creating my system for for cards um so uh, obviously like i'm sure you have your own system for uh for creating your your associations your mnemonics um like once it got to like the kings and the aces um the queens i was like all right let me come up with just some random <laughs> random objects that i can throw right. but for other cards uh like um i don't know two of clubs so every two that's my, it's the same uh, association that I have for my regular two. Um, and then the clubs are so three lobes. So that would be my number three. 
And so that would be 23. So that's a gnome for me. So a two of clubs would be a gnome. And it's the same image that I have for 23. Um, so it's gnome. I I had created a PAO system before um, and and done, you know, uh, my version of that. That's where you put a person or a character, character or person, action and object. But I just found that that wasn't, um, uh, you know, I, I was struggling with that when it came down to the recall. Um, so then I scrapped it and I just, I've, I've stuck to my regular, just two digit system. I'm creating a three digit system for numbers, but because I haven't really competed in competitions, I haven't had the urge to really sit down and, and focus on that. Um, because I, I've been doing this for a few years now and like two digits works fine for me, <laughs> you know, if somebody over to write down a number, uh, like a three digit number, I can just, you know, look at that with my, my true and tested method, uh, of encoding. So, so yeah, when I, it depends on what I'm doing, if it's cards, um, I, I, I use my numbers, uh, my number uh, mnemonics that I already created to to associate those images. And then when I'm memorizing, I do the old fashioned memory palaces. You teach uh, a lot of individuals how to use that and uh, use it in different aspects of their life, whether it's memorizing different languages. <laughs> uh, right. I know that you have a lot of books on that or, you know, just, but the memory palace is, is uh, just fundamental to a lot of us memory athletes when we compete in these competitions. Um, or ways that are you're in school and you're wanting to learn your uh, your school information, you uh, use a memory palace to to encode these mnemonics um, along a specific route so that you can recall it. So I, I do uh, yeah pretty much the, the same as the majority of uh, memory athletes with uh, with the way that I'm memorizing. So in a memory palace, would you have a horizontal structure where you know a club is going to break a crown if you had to? Uh, have king of clubs follow king of hearts the, the club is going to do something to the crown or how do you interact with the images? yes yeah so it would be one right after the other um it would be and then it'll be on that one specific location so i call them locate loci locations um in my mind and then i've subdivided different parts of, of my memory palaces into chunks of five and even within those there's like five within those so like i call it subdividing for okay. i'll give you an example so um in my I, my mom's house is always my go-to my go-to because it was always my first memory palace so whenever i'm memorizing like for speed events in memory competitions uh, whether it's like cards and you have to memorize as many cards as you can or 52 cards in uh, as short a uh, time span as you can then I, I always go to my very first location which is in my mom's house so i'll see my mom's house and i have five rooms that i've chosen there so the living room the kitchen the bathroom my bedroom and then the backyard like for uh, five areas um within those I created five spots. So it was the, um, the couch, the table, the, there was a mirror, um, and there was a, a, a fan, uh, well, like a heater and then the TV. So those are five, five items, five objects within that room. But then I went even further <laughs> and then, uh, I subdivided each one of those. So now I have 25 in each one of these spots. So then the couch, I don't view it as just one location. It's, five locations, five within this area. So I view it as like the couch area, the table area, the mirror area. Um, and then, uh, and yeah, so, so now the couch would be like, there was a window, there is a painting right above the couch. There's uh, these railings that go like when you, it's, uh, it's uh, one of those pull out mattress couches. So you pull it out, there's a railing, um, the mattress itself, and then the side of the couch. So that's five right there. And then I start from the very first thing that I see. So now I go window, boom, that's my first location here in this area. If I'm memorizing, I don't know, like two, three, four, five. So that's a gnome on a rail. So I picture a gnome skateboarding on a rail on the window, and then the rail goes right and breaks through that glass on the window. So I, I create that whole image right there on that first one. And then my next four digits will be on the painting, the next four digits on the, um, the rail and so on and so forth until I do all the, uh, you know, the, all the, all my images and visualization and mnemonics throughout that, throughout that room. So, um, so yeah, that's just for clarity for the listener, you're getting rail because four is R and five is L. Yes. So yep. that, you're so it's, 45 to make an image. Yeah. Simple uh, go to major system <laughs> right, right. for, uh, <laughs> for the. Yeah, <laughs> it's always so interesting because we wind up often having the same images because um, yeah. there's because that's why the major works, right? Is it yeah. helps you create the most likely words. And it seems that somebody, uh, you know, Amy Perry or whoever it was that, you know, sort of codified this for English had in mind the way mm -hmm. language works in order to maximize the possible words that would come from those combinations. 
Um, Genius. <laughs> but the thing for me is that I always find that things like generic words never really work that well. So I have to have Superman bending a rail like he does mm-hmm. in Superman, the movie, uh, the, the Richard Donner movie. You know, he has that train track that gets bent and he bends it back up. So right. he'll be like taking the rail and wrapping it around whatever the next image is. Mm-hmm. Um, but you seem to have to be able to do that just with a strict rail or do you? Often no, well, oh, yeah. So I, I, I always make sure there's some type of action associated with it. If I just place a rail there, I will forget it. <laughs> right, <laughs> It'll right. Be, or I'll see something there that resembles a rail. But if I haven't seen that, if I haven't rem- uh, memorized like 45, um, and I just, I'm doing like a lot of numbers and I come back to that, come recall and I see an object that kind of resembles a rail, but I'm like, what is this? So then I have to like run through all my numbers in my mind so that I, okay, once I get to four or five, I'm like, oh, right. Oh yeah, that, it, there was a rail there. Um, but it, that's if I just place it there without any action, but I always add action. Ron, why he like ingrained this into my brain. You have to have action. Why? Okay. Go back. Did you forget a piece of information that you memorized in a sequence? Yes. Why? It was more than likely because you did not apply any action or the action was very minimal. You didn't use as, uh, as many senses as you possibly could in, within that interaction. I was like, oh yeah, you're probably right. I just placed a, I just placed a cheeseburger there. That was it. And then I walked away <laughs> and I don't know what I placed. Was it a cheeseburger? Was it a chicken burger? Was it uh, something completely different? Was it just a uh, steak? <laughs> so what, what was on there? I don't know. I, you can confuse it. So, so yeah, so the way that I was memorized, so a gnome was skateboarding on the rail. So that was kind of the action there. And then the rail was breaking through the glass. So I'm seeing that whole story happening um, in my brain. And that's how it's not just a rail there. I'm doing some type of action. And it always changes, obviously, with the with the location that I'm placing it. If it was on the mattress, like the the gnome would be skateboarding on the mattress, I mean, on the rail. And then uh, the rail would uh, be bouncing up and down on the mattress. So and then the whole that whole story would just be bouncing up and down. Um, so it's like a modified PAO, but then I have to uh, kind of create it on the spot. But because I've done these like um, these sequences so often, there's, they, you know, each each one like it, the gnome is not always skateboarding. Sometimes he's like spinning, doing like a breakdancing move, spinning on the object, you know, so it, it just depends on the object. A gnome on a rail is skateboarding. That's how I see it, because. What, you know, what, what do kids do when they see a rail? They go on skateboard and they, they do ollies and, and they, they, you know, go on the rail. So right. um, that's kind of, uh, yeah. So it, it, it's always some type of action added to my objects or images or mnemonics. It's not just a static image on there. Right, right. Oh, no, that's great. So now let's talk about, like, what do you do to focus in the thing, in the moment? So I don't, I've never been on um, uh, on a program like you have with Superhuman. Uh, is that what it's called mm-hmm. on Fox? Um, yeah. So n- if I understand this correctly, I, 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 unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. I don't, I stay off social media as much as I can. And I stay That's off good. TV as much as I can. So unfortunately yes. I haven't seen it. I couldn't find a, an episode uh, on the internet to watch it. But if I understand correctly, you actually were there competing with Ron White. Yeah. Yeah. That was awesome. Yep. So when we're talking about focus, I mean, how do you manage in your mind? Not only that you're going to, be memorizing, you know, I think something like 500 details. I saw it, something you had to do with names and so yeah. forth. Mm-hmm. You're going to memorize all this stuff. You're going to recall it. You have to manage whatever it goes on in TV land, because there's got to be cameras and directors Everything. and producers and lighting and all this stuff, like endless mm-hmm. detail. And then you got your teacher or, you know, one of your main influences there. <laughs> that you're going right. to compete with. So how do you manage not only must there must be like fear and, you know, nervousness and excitement and, you know, ego, you know, but then there's also the, the task at hand, the, the being an engineer of all of these mm-hmm. mnemotechnic, you know, pyrotechnics. Right. Take us into this. How do you focus on that? And yeah, recall that's one, all that stuff. <laughs> yes, that is a challenge because I actually before you know talking about that, I'll tell you a time where I failed <laughs> um, on that. And that was uh, there was another TV show that both Ron and I were on as well uh, called Mental Samurai. And I, I, if you look at it, that one is up. I believe uh, if you go to like the Fox website, uh, they, they do have that one. They took down the superhuman one. Um, but uh, they have the Mental Samurai one. But you can find me somewhere throughout all the episodes that they had. And I am on for like 2.5 seconds because <laughs> I screwed up so bad. Uh, oh. That had like the little highlight piece of me like on this machine. Um, but one of the issues that I had with that one 
is that so I'm there, right? So like you're saying, TV land and all these outside distractions are happening. And I am, uh, so Ron and Y were like having a, a thing where um, we're having some banter going back and forth with for the camera. like, oh, I'm going to beat you. No, you're going to beat me. No, 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 no. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to be 2-0. and oh. And so it's a little ba- banter going back and forth. So our segment was supposed to be after the break. So there's going to be like a lunch break. We're going to come back. Like I wasn't even mic'd up or anything. So we're going to come back after the break. And then Ron and I were going to go off and, and do this thing. So in my mind, I'm like fully focused on that. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and do all like my meditation things and my um my anchoring so that I can, I can go back into the states of, of just being present and in the moment after the lunch, because I want to go eat. <laughs> All right. So they called us because there was some type of issue. Like, no, Lewis, where's Lewis? Where's Ron? We need you now up there. I was like, well, I'm not even mic'd up. <laughs> I have no mic on me. Like, here you go. They like strapped on the mic real quick. Like, all right, go. And I have this like power move that I do before. Like I, uh, I go off on stage uh, to do this, or like uh, if I'm doing a presentation in front of, several people um i do like obviously i visualize myself in like the most optimal state i've done a tony robbins events where he has us walking on fire hot flaming hot coals like mm-hmm. thousand degree hot coals and we have to go and you know walk there and then obviously after you're done with that you you celebrate it so i'm visualizing all these things happening in my mind um in moments in the past where i've i've been in optimal peak states um where i've won medals and awards and other things and I pump myself up, but then, so I'm going out there, I'm going out on stage and I get on this contraption. And so we're upside down, right? We're upside down, looking up and the countdown is already happening. Five, four, three, two, one, your challenge is about to start and where you have to like um, compete in different puzzles and quizzes. Anyway, my mom and my sister were in attendance. Okay. And I'm fully focused. I'm ready to go. I've done all my, everything, my, my meditation, everything that like my anchoring, I, I took my vitamins, like my B, I took everything, drink <laughs> a lot of water so I can be like focused. And then I'm there and I'm like, all right, let's go. I'm ready. I'm ready. And then my mom just yells out like, I'm here for you, son. Like, estoy aquí para ti, mijo, mijo, I'm here for you. I was like, no, <laughs> because now I'm trying to focus on on paying attention to the game, but now I'm thinking about my mom and I'm thinking about all the childhood stuff that is Um, happening with me and my mom and her taking me to school. And like all these other thoughts start coming into my mind of my mom and like my sister and like, you know, all the family times and all the good times and like how much I love her. And so I'm like, is this really happening? (laughs) Like, I love my mom, but please don't say a word. And then she keeps adding, like she's cheering me on, but saying all these things that are like triggering for me. Um, And so that really just took me off my, my, my zone, but um, I was able to get back on and, and like focus in, but that first, um, the first round that they had us play, I was struggling a lot because I'm like, I'm trying to focus, but then my mom's thing and I'm starting to get teary eyed and everything started to get blurry, but I was able to snap out of it after the first one and then go through on with the challenge. So um, that's, that was a moment where I ended up losing like on the fourth question. Mm. There's 12 questions. So I lost on the fourth question on that one, but uh, yeah, that one, I don't blame my mom fully. It was still my responsibility, but that's one of the moments where it, like you're saying, like all these things that I prepared for, but that was the one thing I did not prepare for. I didn't think that that was going to affect me as hard as it did. Um, and and so for Superhuman, though, that, that preceded this show, uh, the one that I did end up winning, um, I was like applying all these, all, the same thing. I was doing my visualizations on, on the Tony Robbins, walking through fire, walking on the fire, um, and other times where I was in peak mental state, all the times that I've, I've, folk, I've, uh, I've done my meditation and... Uh, once I was out on that stage, everything just like washed away. Like I had family members there. My mom was there as well, but I couldn't hear her. Thank God. Um, when I was playing it, but it, like Mike Tyson was there and all these celebrities, Ron White was there. And I don't know. I just felt a sense of calmness um, because I had played that, that visual in my mind so often of how I was supposed to be. Once I hit that stage, I visualized that moment like thousands of times before hitting that stage that I was just so calm and so at peace that I didn't even notice the cameras there once my challenge started. Um, And also, though, what I would add to that is that I was very well prepared for that, that that added to me being very calm and relaxed. And I was able to focus because I had trained so much leading up to that moment. 
that no matter what name that w- they would have given me, Paris says Chicago, Illinois. That was one of the girls that was there. She had like this curly hair. And, you know, so I, I didn't care what name Dylan M, you know, I was able to just boom, 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 spit out the, the number, the names, because I had prior, I spent thousands of hours preparing for that. So it's a combination of visualization, visualizing the moment, meditating, doing all these different things. And also obviously just training your butt off because nothing, no matter how much you visualize that you're going to win a championship, if you do not train, you're not going to win a dang thing. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a combination of several, um, several things that led up to me doing well. And at the end of the day, it was, um, it was a vote. So it was who, who the audience liked best. And, you know, they, they, I did well on my challenge. I completed my challenge perfectly. So did Ron White. He did it amazing on his challenge. And then the audience just, uh, they voted for me. <laughs> so it was a little bit of luck as well. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. I mean, practice is the key. It seems to me that a lot of, um, Maybe this is, you know, off into the weeds a little bit, but it seems to me that a lot of the practice lends to procedural memory. So mm-hmm. actually follow just following naturally into relaxation and then the actual execution of whatever techniques you're using. If you're just trained, then it's just going to happen to you now. Yes. Rather than you like forcing it to happen, it just sort of happens to you. So mm-hmm. where I'm going with this is as a meditator, do you have a sense of, of free will or has that left you? Um, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> has your ego dissolved completely or are you still at battle with it? <laughs> um, do I have a sense of free will? So do I make my own life choices? Is that what you're asking? Or is that already subconsciously programmed in my mind? Well, that's the whole thing, right? I mean, in what universe would choice even be possible given the laws that govern reality? Hmm. That is a very deep question. (laughs) (laughs) Because uh, I do feel, well, yeah, because uh, these are very, um, I I think about these things all the time. I don't talk about, uh, is there a call coming in? No, sorry, sorry. I I have a thing with my mouth, so I have to drink a lot. I was just pouring more water. Hopefully it didn't sound like uh, one of my mnemonics was urinating. (laughs) Oh, no. You know what? I'm getting a call. Oh, (laughs) From my, I turned off my phone. I'm sorry. Uh, hopefully you can cut this part, but um, sure. I, I put my phone on silent, but my watch is still active and I just got a call. <laughs> sorry. Let me turn that off. I'm going to go like about, this so that uh, it gets picked up in editing. <laughs> talk, about, talk about focus and distraction. I literally turned off my phone, but then my, my watch. Um, so I thought that was you for, I was like, what? why is my thing going off? Um, I'm just doing this because yeah, so, I'll be able to find it easier in editing, but cool. yeah. So we're talking about free will. <laughs> I, I I think about free will. Uh, I mean, I used to think about it all the time. Like, do we have free will? Are we just pre-programmed? They've done studies. I don't know. Like, I haven't looked at this uh, for many years, but um, um, they've done studies where I think it's in Bleak by Malcolm. Mal- Malcolm Gladwell did this one. Um, someone did it. Somebody famous <laughs> wrote about this. But they were uh, they'll do the, the MRI test or the, the brain scans, um, and they have somebody choose different uh let's say it's you know um i don't know a flower versus a sunset you know and so they'll tell the individual okay tell us what you're going to choose okay all right boom i i'm choosing the flower i like the flower i'm choosing the flower but like several seconds even before that they thought that they were thinking about a flower their brain was already going off Mm -hmm. saying this is the right choice like you're going to choose the left side here the flower um and so for a for a moment there, when I was when I looked at that study, uh, I thought that like, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point of choosing something? Like our brains are already gonna decide for us. Our brains are, you know, it's a pre-programmed structure inside of our skull that already knows that right now I'm gonna pick this up. This microphone. I just picked up my microphone <laughs> for those that are not watching, but I'm picking up the microphone. My brain already knows that I'm picking that up, or my brain already knows that I'm about to go silent. Mm. before i even decided to go silent so what's like should i just live my life and just go about and do whatever you know but am i making those was it my choice to pick up there was it my will to pick up the microphone was it my choice to go silent or is it my choice to beat my heart right now is it your choice anthony to listen to the words that i'm saying right now um do you have to consciously think about your ears working all the time your your your, your lungs to be breathing in the oxygen uh you know is it your i don't know um it's uh i i do still believe that we do 
have free will. We still still do decide. Um, and also at the same time, it is based on a pre-programmed um, pre-programmed thought process that it is happening at a subconscious level in our brains where, man, this is a tough subject. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I do have an answer, well, not an answer, but what I think is right and the way that I'm viewing this uh, subject. But so we do have free will. We do decide on what to do, how to do things, but it's based on how we or outside influences have programmed our brain to running uh, these these thought patterns. And I believe that we can alter the way that our programs um, run the thought patterns in our brain by doing different activities. So if you really want to like dig deeper into say ADD, is it just like a pill that's going to fix you? You just take Ritalin and that's it. Your ADD is gone. Um, I also believe that that could be a program in our brain because we, we programmed ourselves or through outside influences, through the media, through parents, through friends, through whatever, to be distracted, to to allow our brains to dis be distracted easily. And all that we have to do is rewire our brains to uh, to not get distracted so easily. But um, but yeah, uh, and that is a thought. That is a an action, a free will action that we must take. I must decide to allow my brain to change that thought pattern. Anyway, I could probably keep going, but it's probably going to be in the same loop. <laughs> um, but I'm not sure if that was kind of what you were get, alluding to with the, with the question, but... Uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I I think it's sort of the ultimate question because we have... Well, first of all, there's a difference between acts of will and the ability to have free will. You know, for, for example, like the flower versus mountain or whatever the pictures might be, right? That is, is pretty obvious to solve, right? So the brain is doing sorts of things, uh, but there's only so many objects in the world, right? And mm -hmm. it's not really choice. It's selection from the objects that are put in front of you. So the idea of choice is not correct at all. It's, it's you're asking the wrong question. So mm -hmm. a lot of the free will issue is, is choice versus selection. And when we use memory techniques, we are limiting we're even eliminating choice, right? We've already mm -hmm. pre-selected. It's going to be a rail for 45 period. Uh, it, yeah, it's going to connect with a skateboarder or maybe it's going to do this, that, or the other thing. But we've actually taken choice out of the equation. It's just 45 yeah. is the rail, right? Um, yep. So uh, there's that sort of element to it. But then in mm. terms of, I mean, this is the Nobel Prize question. Yeah, okay, you make the decision. Change, change your life now. Learn memory techniques and so forth, right? Yeah. Well, Okay, so what, what, how are we going to get people to do that? The question is, why did the majority not do it, but we did? So hmm. then we have only a story. And the story is, you found Ron White somehow, right? Yeah. You just did, right? You didn't like say, I'm going to choose to find the guy that will help make the transformation, right? right. You didn't even really particular, or I'm, I'm just, sorry, I don't mean to say authoritatively, you didn't do this way, but, mm -hmm. you know, just generally, one didn't even select it because it, mm -hmm. it, it somehow appears, right? And I'm not talking mm -hmm. about some mystical sort of thing that guides fate and reality, but rather mm -hmm. it just sort of is there. And then all of a sudden the chemical change happens in the brain and then we're off in this direction. So yeah. I, I think uh, as a med one meditator to the other, we know about the problem of suffering and all that sort of stuff. It's mm -hmm. just kind of, um, and it's why I commend you and compliment you on the work you do through your website and your YouTube channel and so forth, is that it's like, passing this traditional wisdom on of memory techniques to get more people running into the trees in the forest of mnemonics or whatever, you know, yeah. so that we have more people that have the opportunity to, to sort of go down that, that track. And hopefully they too go, they get it and they go, yeah, I'm going to limit my choices and just have rail for 45 from now <laughs> on or whatever they choose. Right. Uh, yeah. Based on whatever system. So yeah, because it, 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 it can get complicated and, mm -hmm your your brain thinks that learning is, co is a compli complicated task. Learning a new language is definitely, if you just tell your brain, you're about to learn Chinese. You're like, no <laughs> way, bro. What are you talking about? That's impossible. I'm not going to do that. So you, all these words and the new way of, uh, of using your tongue to say these words, that's never going to happen. But if you do, if you combine that with something that your brain does know, such as some type of mnemonic device to, to help step by step, step by step, but like baby steps, uh, taking chunks, like I was talking about earlier, you, you start small, you start small, and then you work your way up. 
uh, same thing with the, you know, so like Chinese. Uh, I was in China uh, for the world competition, world memory championship. Mm. And I was trying to ask for water. Um, and water, I was like, I had no idea how to say water <laughs> in right. China. So I wanted water. I was at a restaurant and, uh, and she pointed to all the liquor that she had up, up there. I was like, no, I don't drink. I don't, I don't want liquor. <laughs> I want water, water. And then somebody just like miraculously just like popped her head in. She's like, oh, Shui. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, uh, talk badly about the language. But, uh, you know, she was saying what, how she was speaking Chinese. And then she said like, Shui, Shui, Shui. And I was like, oh, shui. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, shui. What is that? She's like, that's water. I'm like, oh, awesome. The way that I meant, but still, if I was just taking shui and that was it, I would I would not right now be telling you this example for shui because I would have no idea how to say water in Chinese. But the, uh, well, uh, what is it? Mandarin. Um, there's different, there's Cantonese. and But for Mandarin, it's uh, shui. The way that I memorize that is I picture like a boot or a shoe, um, a shoe with water filled with water. And I'm like chugging, chugging the water from this shoe. Shui was uh, the water in there. So my brain took this very complex, complicated idea of learning a new language and it made it much more uh, easily digestible by uh, attaching to something that I, my brain already has some type of um, visual representation of that that thing, that abstract idea, which was uh, shui, that word shui. So I'm like, okay, shui, I think of shu, shu, shui, water. That's easy to picture. I can just pour like a bottle of water inside the shoe and then just drink out of it. Um, mm. And then just recall that a few times and boom, that's it. Um, so so yeah, like what you're saying, you, you're you collapsing all these options into just a few. Um, because if you're, if you're out there, another Chinese restaurant in the future um, and you're trying to get water again, but you did not link shui to anything in your brain and it's just bouncing around in there. It's so hard to retrieve it because you didn't link it to something that your brain easily could that already knew um, it will be much more complicated. And that's why it, it will say, that's it. We're never learning another foreign word again <laughs> because this is way too hard. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's where uh, memory techniques definitely makes that transition point a lot easier for, for individuals. So everybody go and learn something with yeah, this Yeah, go do it. Because then, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's the perfect example, right? I, I used for shui, I used um, uh, a Schwinn bike, right? But oh, yeah. yours is even better because you know, you've got the, the water in the shoe, you can, you can do more with it, but mm -hmm. one way or another, whatever, whatever one does, um, you can build onto it. And I wish people, more people knew just how easy it was. If you're pre-prepared to just look at the letters like you've done, because then you mm -hmm. could, you know, if you want to have hot water or warm water, anyway, you could say by Kai Shui, right. And, uh, then mm -hmm. you get, you get a bike and a kite and it's just like, Oh, that's a good, yeah. That's a, what I, the moment that you said that I did not know that that's what it was, but by Kai Shui, I, get, I think that's what you said. Um, yeah, I picture a bike. So then a bike, maybe a bike with, uh, and I have my shoes up on the handlebars and then water just by every, it's raining and the water just splashing everywhere. I don't know, mm -hmm. something like that. But uh, um, yeah, it's just about using, it, it's fun. You see how we're just like, even doing this, I'm adding on to your stories and we're going back and forth, but uh, you're adding on to my visuals and it's, uh, it's a fun way of learning it. It's a fun way of learning something new like this. And we can keep mm -hmm. going on and you can probably teach me more Chinese right now in like the next five minutes. And I've learned my entire life just by doing mnemonics. So um, this is definitely a, a different way of doing it, but uh, a very entertaining way. And, and mm -hmm. one that does like right now I'm smiling more. My face is probably like turning a little bit more red because my brain's like excited that, that we're doing this. Um, and that's all these different chemicals are, are, um, you know, going back and forth with my, my neurons right now. And, uh, that's, uh, it's happy right now. Uh, there's a book called happy chemicals and my brain is definitely happy right now <laughs> with all the chemicals, <laughs> by just going through these stories. Right, right. Well, that, that raises an interesting issue. And, it seems to me it's been on my mind a lot, which is, you know, and I come back to the Nobel Prize kind of sort of how we solve this problem. And it seems like it probably already is solved, which is, you know, there may there may be that there needs to be more one on one sort of actual sharing of the mnemonics themselves with people who are interested to to use it. So what's your what's your take on the range of ways people can learn memory techniques there's books there's courses there's you know studying the competition manuals and going to compete and learning through competition and then there's actually like one-on-one -on -one, uh just as you and i are going back and forth sharing this sort of stuff um and you can pick something up that quickly you know wh where do you how do you how do you help an individual understand what's going to be best for them so that they can hit the ground running um, as opposed to 
maybe just failing a lot because books aren't going to work for everybody and courses aren't going to work for everybody. And even one-on-one training isn't going to work for everybody. I think it's more of community, building a community. And um, I reached out to several individuals when I was first starting out memorizing uh, Ron White, Nelson Dallas, Brad Zup. Those are like the key three individuals that I started back in 20, well, 2011 was when I picked up the course. 2012 was when I went to my first competition the USA one. And I reached out to them because I went through his course, but also like, I didn't go with the idea of wanting to compete in the competition. I just wanted to not fail in school to not get fired. (laughs) Uh, That's why I took his course. But, um, I, once I started seeing that individuals were doing this to like compete, I'm like, that's, that's kind of odd. I've never heard of this before, but that's pretty interesting. Maybe this will elevate my ability to, to memorize and learn uh, much more rapidly by going to these competitions when I give it a shot. So I was going through his program, but his program is like, is more for like the av- everyday individual that wants to like memorize the grocery list, things like that. Uh, and he teaches you a little bit about competition, but not necessarily how to like train because it's a different aspect of it when you want to train for a competition than when you just want to memorize uh, directions. <laughs> um, okay. You have to create your schedule and then you have to uh, block. Okay. These days I'm going to do cards and numbers and next day I'll do names and, and words. And then this other day. So you got to structure it. So training is much different. Uh, so I, I think it, it depends on the individual and what their goals are with training. If all you want to do is just memorize, um, you know, grocery list or directions or names and faces books Books alone will help you out with that. A few video YouTube videos, the techniques are out there. You know, go and get some of Anthony's books. Go and watch, you know, listen to his podcast. Go and watch some of my stuff. I, I have a whole series on, on names and faces. If you just want to have like just some basic understanding of how this works, I think, you know, uh, books and videos, they'll do, the, they'll do the job. If you want to go deeper and to like train for a competition, that's where you do more of a one-on-one or you contact other individuals that are competing. And what I love about this community is that everybody here for the most part is uh, very open to sharing their ideas and the way that they train. They're not scared that you might learn what they do and then try to beat them. No, they want that competition. And Mm -hmm. Alex Mullen loves the fact that other people uh, Alex Mullen is a multi, I think, two-time world memory champion, multiple-time USA memory champion. He's, like, broken all kinds of records. Um, but uh, he loves that, like, Simon Reinhardt out in, in Germany is, like, training all the time to to be the best as well. And uh, Johannes as well. Like, all these guys all over the world are, are training to compete. So they're they're okay. Like, he he's shared um, the way that he trains with me and, and other individuals also. Um, so... I think that would be the key for somebody that wants to train for a competition or also to apply for other areas of life, like, like school, um, go into a community, ask, go on Facebook. Don't like, don't spam people, but maybe send them an email. Like, Hey, uh, I like your work. I've seen your YouTube videos. Um, I've seen your content. I would love to you know pick your brain, learn a little bit more. Maybe we can go back and forth on, uh, through email or through Facebook. If you're okay with that. Um, there's coaches, I don't, I don't personally do any more coaching um, at this point. Maybe later I will. But there's coaches. You can hire a coach. You can pay them whatever the rate is, uh, very well-deserved, whoever it is, whether it's Anthony or somebody else that's out there coaching right now, and pay them to do one-on-one. That's where you get literally undivided attention, focus, undivided attention for 30 minutes, for an hour straight, where you can ask any question, and they can guide you, and they can tweak um, any, any aspects of your training and really help elevate you and push you and, and put that little turbo boost so you can learn this much faster. So I think it, it depends. To answer your question, it depends on the individual and what their goals are um, as far as like how they should train or get started. Uh, definitely going through like books and videos and then just sitting down, failing a lot. Um, and then once you're tired of failing, reach out to people. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, go to, there's so many communities out there. Uh, like go to memory. If you go to memory league, memoryleague.org or .com, if you just go to the Memory League website, there's so many individuals right there that would love to train with you. If you're just starting from scratch, there's a lot of other people there also starting from day one that would love to train with you. Even if you never talk with them or just do chat, they have like chats on there. You can go back and forth and, okay, hey, let's let's go uh, do one-on-one competitions on numbers. Let's do one-on-one competitions on words. So you can just do, you know, and both, and let's say both of you could only memorize like five words in 60 seconds. That's that's fine. You're, you're starting off. Um, and so, you know, you go back and forth. They do six, you do five. That motivates you. Now I want to do seven next game. Let's go again. I'll do seven words. You do, you know, you do six. I beat you. So it's like a little competition. So I think it depends on the person, their goals, and also 
there is a way to get better no matter what your goals are um, and no matter what approach you take really. Right, right. Yeah, that's brilliant. Well, with all that in mind, you know, there's been some real gems here and really appreciate the, the time and be able to speak. What's coming up next for you and where can people find you? I, I mean, I know you've got um, books of your own as well, uh, Better Memory Now, and um, I, I, just what's coming up next and where do people go? Yeah, so I have uh, Better Memory Now. I have a Remember Names book. If you want to just do names and faces, I have that available on Amazon. So all these books are available on Amazon. But for me, my uh, I, I do a lot of YouTube videos uh, and I'm doing a lot more right now. Uh, I'm, I'm spending more time on helping individuals to really tap into that ability for them to focus and doing different tips and techniques that I use on my every in my everyday life to help me out with that. Like one of the methods of like chunking your time and to helping you to stop like procrastination. That's one of the issues that people have when they have like focus issues is that they procrastinate <laughs> too much. Why? Because they're in these distraction zones. They're in these, these loops where they're happy with uh, not doing anything else. Um, and whether they're okay with that or not, or they want to change that, I, you know, I, I make videos to help people with that. And I, I did a video where I modified the Pomodoro technique um, where you, to get started, you set your timer and you do five minutes or 15 minutes or 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is. Um, I like to do a 15 minute chunks and that gets you going. If you've been putting off a, like from reading a book for several months, you're like, okay, I'll get to that book eventually. No, do it right now. Set your timer, 15 minutes, do what, however many pages you're going to do in those 15 minutes, that's it. Put the book down and go do something else after that. But now in your brain, you're like, oh, that was easy. That wasn't too hard. I, I did like 20 pages in 15 minutes. Cool. My next 15 minute chunk, I'll do another 20 pages. And then progress, it's what uh, will get you to keep going and keep that momentum going. So yeah, check out my YouTube channel, AE Mind. That's uh, probably the biggest plug I can do. <laughs> uh, YouTube.com slash AE Mind. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a great channel. And, you know, things like adding the modifications to Pomodoro that you mentioned on that video, which is a great video, you know, it's, it's going to be powerful for people and please keep exploring those ideas. Cause I think, you know, the, the individual exploring as you're doing and sharing that is, is part of that thing that helps more people transform as, uh, as you yourself were able to do. And I've been able to do, and it's just an amazing thing for, for people. So thank you again so much. And, uh, Hope to do this. I hope to do this again in the future. All right. Thanks. Well, at the risk of overdoing it, I want to thank Lewis again for his time, his expertise, and his experiences. Make sure to check out his YouTube channel, his site, his book, and your support for all memory teachers is always much appreciated. As one of my values is to have the magnetic memory method moving forward to bind as many voices and perspectives together as we possibly can. So thank you for being part of that mission. Thanks for your thumbs up. Thanks for being subscribed. And hey, listen, that Ron White guy Lewis was talking about, he's got a lot of tips of his own for dealing with things that disrupt your focus and concentration. So why not check out our in-depth conversation with Ron White next?